Hello everyone, welcome to GGN. Today's Thursday, September 20th, 2012, and I'm Darko. The links will be posted in YouTube's video description. In this first video, we're going to cover um, Asia, China, Japan, um, India, also Russia, what's going on in the Caucasus, and actually I'll try to swing into so South America news, or Central America news, what's going on in Venezuela before the elections. A lot of elections are going on um, this fall around the world. Uh, the first up is something that has been covered this is from the 17th of September. China and Japan are heading towards war, says the former director of the CIA, now the De Department of Defense Secretary, uh, Leon Panetta. says China and other Asian countries could end up at war over territorial disputes if governments keep up their provocative behavior. So two days later, September 19th, Panetta tries to convince China-U.S. military buildup is not aimed at containment. So he isn't fooling anybody, it says here as it is widely acknowledged that the Asia pivot is about blocking China's rise. The defense secretary was on a recent trip to China to try to downplay America's militarism in Asia Pacific and convince the Chinese that it is not an attempt to contain China's rise. We have a quote here that says, Our rebalance to the Asia Pacific region is not an attempt to contain China. It is an attempt to engage China and expand its role in the Pacific, he said. It is about creating a new model in the relationship of the two uh, Pacific powers. So this is about trade. So the strategic pivot to Asia Pacific involves surging American military presence throughout the region, aims at containing China, and has been slowly provoking negative reactions across official China. I've covered about drones actually over there as well, uh, monitoring the issue. That was like a month or two ago. According to uh, this Andrew Nathan and Scoble in a recent piece on foreign affairs, China is the only country widely seen as a possible threat to U.S. predominance. Indeed, China's rise has led to fears that the country will soon overwhelm its neighbors and one day supplant the United States as the global hegemon. So besides ta uh, Taiwan, Washington has also been building new military bases and refurbishing old ones in the region in order to lay the groundwork for an air-sea battle with China. The idea is to have enough U.S. bases peppered throughout the region so that China would be too surrounded to safely attack. In a recent report from CSIS predicted the next year could see a shift in Chinese foreign policy based on the new leadership's judgment that it must respond to a U.S. strategy that seeks to prevent China's re-emergence as a great power. So they say that the potential harsh reaction is already detectable. Um, since the Asia pivot by the U.S., it's triggered outpouring of anti-American sentiment in China that will increase pressure on the new leadership in China. Nationalistic voices are calling for military countermeasures to the bolstering of America's military posture in the region and the new U.S. defense strategic guidelines. And when they refer to that, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, it's about trade, U.S. defense strategic uh, guidelines, talking about trade routes and stuff like that, and capitalizing on low-wage uh, labor. There's a U.S.-Japan alliance that's meant to limit China. China has warned Japan over the landing of two Japanese on a group of disputed uh, islets or islands amid more anti-Japan protests across China over the islands claimed by the two economic heavyweights and Taiwan. So Pressure V talked uh, with this political commentator Bill Jones, who's quoted saying they, the U.S. authorities, have initiated the Asia pivot, they keep calling this in quotes, which is generally recognized as being an attempt to limit China's influence. So from September 18th, 2012, Chinese general says prepare for combat. Top Chinese general in unusual move tells troops to ready for combat with Japan. So some of these uh, signs that these uh, Chinese were carrying read uh, kill all Japanese and fight to the death over disputed islands. One sign urged China to threaten a nuclear strike against Japan. So this is a picture of anti-Japan protesters surrounding policemen. So. so just some background. Last week following the Japanese government purchase of three of these uh, islands from private Japanese owners, six Chinese maritime security ships were deployed near the islands, uh, heightening tensions. But I think just like everything else, um, f you know, Japan is uh, pretty much with the West, with the United States and that. And um, it originally the island actually had... Uh, been, I guess, what was Chinese, and then it, uh, back in the 70s or so, uh, the United States had had it, and they bought it from Japan, then went back to Japan, and now it's been uh, in private hands, and they just basically nationalize it all out of the, you know, out of the thin air, right? Well, no, there's supposedly um, these natural gas reserves or oil reserves there, so it's a pretty big deal for Japan, who doesn't really have any kind of, um, they don't have any type of um, uh, resources as far as energy uh, needs go. 
So this is a big deal for them. But it also makes me wonder if this was uh, provocateur uh, to begin with, right? With the whole thing, it's kind of weird how it's all happening with the embassies in the Middle East and around the world. And now you have this um, tension between China and Japan. Uh, so maybe the whole reason of just nationalizing the islands was to get uh, the Chinese ships uh, to to drive over there and then uh, create this tension. So then the uh, articles, uh, like I'm about to cover here, uh, the CFR can say, um, you know, oh, there's a tide of nationalism and uh, what are we going to do about it? Um, because it's all about problem, reaction, and solution, right? So, you know, what do the globalists say? The uh, escalating dynamic on the high seas is worrisome and the absence of a maritime crisis management regime for the East China Sea is even more troubling. The absence of a maritime crisis management regime for the East China Sea is even more troubling. And just recently, the cabinet secretary uh, for Japan announced that Japan was uh, preparing for a variety of scenarios and mobilizing its defenses accordingly. So this is from September 17th. Uh, China steps up military air force drills in Tibet. So amid the dispute, the uh, army has scaled up its military exercises on all fronts, including aerial drills by its air force. Special operation forces from the People's Liberation Army have begun an annual set of military drills aimed at training reconnaissance capabilities and survival skills. The scale of military exercises by the Army, Navy, and Air Force has gone up after recent joint military drills held by the U.S. and Japanese military. So the government of Japan incorporated these islands into Okinawa Prefecture in 1895 after it confirmed that the islands were not under control of the uh, Qing Dynasty. Uh, he said, adding that China had not asserted sovereignty over the islands until the 1970s when it learned that the islands were possibly situated nearby large reserves of oil. So Japan controlled these islands until after World War II when they came under the temporary control of the United States. China does not recognize the 51 Treaty of San Francisco in, in which basically they transferred it to Washington. And of course, in 72, the U.S. transferred the islands back to Japan. 71, that such move was totally illegal says uh, China, and that uh, is an integral part of Chinese territory, so it's been going on for a while. Then from September 19th, China warns Japan on economic fallout. They warn Japan that its decision to purchase disputed islands in the East China Sea would damage the bilateral trades between the two countries. Then we have this one, Beijing hints at bond attack on Japan. Senior advisor to China's government has called for an attack on the, Ch the Japanese bond market to precipitate a funding crisis in bring the country to its knees unless Tokyo reverses its decision to nationalize the islands. So they're talking about economic warfare here. And North Korea, China gets a 30-year lease on a North Korean port. Recently obtained the rights for a 30-year lease on the port North uh, Korea. It aims at boosting trading between China, South Korea, Russia, and Japan. And talking about energy, Japan softened stance on the 2040 nuclear power phase-out policy. So we heard about them going... Uh, basically ending nuclear power by 2040, whatever, and then they basically uh, backpedaled on it. This is from September 19th. But uh, like I said, uh, you know, as far as oil and coal and all, all that goes, they don't really have any of that. So they'd have to go completely to wind or solar or any other type of um, a new type of system, which would be great if they just if they spearheaded it or something and started something up. But uh, it's so hard to do that, I think, to get all the infrastructure going and get people invested in it. So they're just going to resort to importing all their oil and their energy needs and going with nuclear, even if it's killing their own people, right, with radiation. The U.S. Before we get to that article, Japan okays deployment of ospreys to Okinawa. They said Wednesday it approved a controversial deployment of ospreys to Okinawa, adding that it believes a Marine Corps hybrid aircraft is safe despite public concern. And it's kind of like this. Uh, from April 26, 2012, U.S.-Japan deal... Uh, to withdraw 9,000 Marines from Okinawa, and that actually fell through, just like the nuclear thing, where they ended up, uh, the U.S. ended up getting what they wanted. Then India, China fears India is backing Japan as tussle escalates. So the Chinese officials are worried the growing relationship between India and Japan, its main rival, it's meant to contain and counter it. This revelation comes from two Chinese experts at a time when China is engaged in serious conflict with Japan over these islands. So the deepening relationship between the two countries comes from a lack of visible conflicts as well as the two nations sharing similar views on global affairs. Uh, this was interesting because just recently, in at first, Indian tank brigades to defend China border. So it was cleared by the Ministry of Defense in India involved raising six new armored regiments equipped with 348 tanks and three mechanized infantry battalions will be raised on the China border. It says such formations are traditionally used for striking into enemy territory. 
Uh, this is my website, Global Government News. Uh, the website is ggnonline.com. Uh, the poll is closed there, but if you'd like to help me with donations, it would be very, very much appreciated at this time. And I'd like to thank those who have donated in the past. So um, the links will be posted in YouTube's video description, so check them out. Um, Russia follows America's Asian pivot. So we're talking about the Asia pivot, right? And now Russia follows suit. Barack Obama used a speech to the Australian Parliament last year to signal the U.S. would pivot towards Asia. Now Russian President Vladimir Putin has used a major international summit to signal a similar move. So they're talking about um, Russia has long been an intrinsic part of the Asia-Pacific region. Says He says, we view this region as the most important factor for the successful future of the whole country. He says, the writer says the first line is a bit of fib, while Russia is geographically Eurasian. In fact, most of its land mass is considered to be Asia. It has, until recently, had very little to do with the region. It still conducts more than half of its trade with Europe and less than a quarter with Asia. But the second part of his statement is a spot on. Russia is unlike, unlikely to have a bright economic future unless it finds a way to harness the stunning growth of Asia, particularly China. The city where the summit was held was um, Vladivostok, I believe it's pronounced, means ruler of the east or power over the east, depending on which translation you use, but neither description is remotely accurate. If you remember from almost two years ago, China and Russia to drop dollar in bilateral trade, so that's part of their pivot as well. Stop using the dollar to settle bilateral trade, instead use the ruble or yuan. And then big news, uh, Russia reveals shiny state secret. It's a wash in diamonds, so trillions of carats lie below a 35 million year old 62 mile diameter asteroid crater in eastern Siberia. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. The Russians have known about it since the late 1970s. Russia just declassified the news, and this will shake the world gem markets to their core. I think what's important here is that they're twice as hard as the usual gemstones, making them ideal for industrial and scientific uses. We're talking about possibly space stuff and futuristic technology. It's not really futuristic. It's happening right now. And then we have what? Uh, why is Putin stockpiling gold? So according to the World Gold Council, Russia has more than doubled its gold reserves in the past five years. Putin has taken advantage of the financial crisis to build the world's fifth biggest gold pile in a handful of years and is buying about half a billion dollars worth every month. And some gold news. It says here it's been very strong over the past few weekly candles and it's now nearing uh, a couple of overhead resistance levels. So, so we're talking about uh, how it was at 1800 and almost 1900. It says if that happens, it will probably be the most watched double top situation in generation. I don't know what the plan is to prevent it from building a base over 1920 an ounce but I'd be ready for a pretty spectacular show. Not sure if I pronounced this right, but tungsten filled 10 ounce gold bar found in the middle of Manhattan's jewelry district. What makes so devious is a real gold bar is purchased with the serial numbers and papers and it'll howl it out. The gold is sold, the tungsten is put in, and the bar is closed up. That is a sophisticated operation. Swiss manufacturers say customers should buy from a reputable merchant. The problem is, he admits, that Ibram Fadel is a very reputable merchant. But the author says, all that said, with false flags rampant these days, we would not be surprised if this is merely yet another attempt to discredit gold, this time physical. Um, it says here, so buyer beware in a time when everyone is broke, triple check before exchanging one store of wealth for another. So I was hoping to be able to get to all of this in one video, but like always, it's just not enough time. If I were to go any faster, it would just, it would make no sense even trying to cover it all. So uh, we'll continue uh, with Russia and what's going on over there, and then we'll segue into Central and South America and the drug trade and drug cartels, what's going on, because a lot of uh, drug cartel leaders getting nabbed right now in Colombia and Mexico. So it's all about consolidating, right? Consolidation, kind of like what's going on in Europe. So I guess we'll leave with this article. Russian foreign minister says, U.S. aid trying to influence elections. So a blunt statement explains order to end the U.S. government operations. So it's shedding more light on the Russian government's order that the U.S. aid end all operations in the country. Foreign ministry has issued a statement confirming speculation that indeed the move was related to concerns of election tampering. It says it's about attempts to influence the political process, including elections of various types and institutions of civil society through the distribution of grants. So they also said, uh, their uh, statement insisted, saying that they were worried in particular about the meddling in the caucus region.
So the U.S. was already aware of this, and the regime officials in the U.S. said the U.S. would continue to support democracy in Russia. Some of the Russian opposition groups actually received direct money from the U.S. government. Thank you.